Hello, my name is Kyle Sebastian, and I am the JED Campus Learning Community Coordinator at the JED Foundation. The JED Foundation is a leading nonprofit that exists to protect emotional health and prevent suicide for our nation's teens and young adults. JED has also partnered with over 275 colleges and universities through our signature program, JED Campus which is designed to guide schools through a collaborative process of comprehensive systems, program and policy development to build upon existing student mental health, substance use and suicide prevention efforts. Today, I am joined by Dr. Sharon Mitchell, Senior Director of Student Wellness at the University of Buffalo, Dr. Greg Eels, Executive Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Mary Chandler Bolin, Director of the Counseling Center at the University of Kentucky. Our th three speakers are governing board members of the Association for College and University Counseling Center Directors, which is an international organization comprising universities and colleges and their leaders for student mental health, representing a wide range of professional disciplines, public and private institutions, and a range of institutional student enrollment sizes. Uh, we are all excited to present, present today's webinar on a multidimensional understanding of effective university and counts, college counseling center organizational structures, the white paper for which you can find published in the Journal of College Student Psychotherapy. Before I pass the presentation to Sharon, Greg, and Mary, I'd uh, like to actually share a couple of housekeeping notes for today's webinar. So first, if you need closed captioning services at any point during the presentation, please use the link that was provided in the GoToWebinar chat box as you logged in today. Similarly, if at any point during the webinar you have a question for our speakers, please type it into the question box on your dashboard and we will answer it during our Q&A at the end of today's presentation. You will also be able to find a PDF version of today's slides under the handout section on your dashboard. And finally, for those unable to join this call live, this webinar will be recorded for all current webinar registrants, as well as any future registrants via JED's Mental Health Resource Center, as well as the registration link you used to join us today. And now with all of that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Greg and the team who will uh, begin today's presentation. All right. Thank you, Kyle. On to our first slide. So our objectives for today, we want to describe a little bit of the historical background of mental health services on college campuses, what all of us and many of us have been doing on college campuses over the years, and talk about some of the landscape that's out there, explain the differences between some of the integrated and comprehensive counseling center models. As most of you on this call know, I think one of the issues that we're all struggling with is how best to structure our mental health services as demand for our services increases, as oftentimes funding models are, are flat, and how to do that work in relationship to student health. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to review three research studies on college counseling center organizational structures, and then talk about some of the challenges around collaborating between a college counseling center and a health service, uh, where the tensions may be, uh, and where some, some benefits may be. And then we'll articulate necessary conditions for quality of care for students, regardless of the organizational structure, because I think all of us, if we're in this work, we're in it because we care about students and we want to keep the students at the center of the care we're providing them. All right, so all of us are, are members of AUCCD and are on the AUCCD board. Sharon is the current president. I'm the president-elect, and Mary is one of our, our board members. Our, our vision really is to be the higher education leaders for student mental health. All of us on this webinar represent decades of college mental health work. We represent you know, hundreds and hundreds of, and thousands of staff across the country, and, and we really see that that work allows us to be leaders around student mental health and talk about the, the kind of care that's provided that we that we provide to our students across the country. Our, our mission is we're a professional community. We foster director development and success. Uh, we help make our colleagues successful in their roles. I know for me personally, I wouldn't be able to survive in my job without this organization. Our mission is also to advance the mission of higher education. Where we try to innovate, educate, and advocate for college mental health and all of us do that through a lens of social justice. We're committed to inclusive excellence and promoting social justice. Our members, we have 930 directors and 156 Ameritai members. I think that that figure shows how dedicated people are to this organization. And our organization represents a wide range of professional disciplines, social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, master's level folks in, in business and administration, uh, just to name a few. We're about half public and half private institutions. 
a full range of institution size from institutions with hundreds of students to institutions of, of tens of thousands of students. Uh, most of our members come from predominantly four-year domestic U.S. institutions. Uh, but we have expanded to more international students. We have members come from Australia, the Middle East, Europe. 20% uh, of ACCCD members are, are JED campus members as well. So just to talk a little bit about college mental health and some of the historical tensions. Uh, if you look at the history of college mental health, the first clinic was established by Stuart Patton in Princeton in, in 1910. And it was related to a, a, a series of suicides. Uh, you saw in, in, throughout the, 19, the teens, obviously World War I kind of took over historically from a lot of the world's attention. A lot of psychologists began to do placement and testing, looking at meeting the needs of, of the war effort in, in Europe as well as in the United States. You saw the development of the mental hygiene movement in, in the United States and Europe with psychiatrists, you know, in health centers. You saw a medical model developing at some of the, the Ivy League schools. Uh, the Great Depression saw the guidance movement with people being very focused, obviously, on the more basic needs of, of getting a job, vocational training, being able to feed themselves and their families. Uh, and then the focus really shifted with World War II. Uh, World War II brought, and it meant post-World War II, brought in a lot of first-generation non-traditional college students. You know, in, in the 30s and 40s, you saw some of the more educationally and developmentally oriented counseling centers begin to develop, like at the University of Minnesota developed in the 30s their counseling center. You saw Carl Rogers found one of the first counseling centers at the University of Chicago post-World War II in the 1940s. So you saw this humanistic developmental influence come into play as college students were were beginning to grow as a, as a student body. You saw students returning from the war on the GI Bill, uh, dealing with trauma and other mental health issues. You know, in the 1950s, you saw the growth of that movement. Many counseling centers began to grow. AUCCCD was founded uh, about almost 70 years ago in uh, 1950, mostly representing Big Ten schools, where most of those schools had, began, had and began to develop college counseling centers. And, and, that, and that began to grow. You saw the DSM uh, begin the, the DSM-1 come into play, and you started to see more relevant diagnoses where you plan, where you saw some of the planting of the seeds that, are, that represent some of the tensions today. Uh, in the DSM-1, diagnoses were referred to as reactions, so that they acknowledged some of the contextual issues and contextual cultural stressors that led to some of the mental health concerns people were presenting with. Uh, you saw the change in the countercultural movement in the 60s, Cold War, space race, a lot of emphasis on science. You also saw more counselors being trained, and you saw most counseling centers begin to grow in what they did uh, because they were meeting the needs of more and more students throughout the 1960s. Obviously, the, the Vietnam era, civil rights, women's movement, the focus on diversity, the advent of, of black psychology in the 1970s. People like Joe White began to develop ideas that really looked at race and culture, which greatly influenced how counseling centers developed. Uh, and then you saw more and more severe and chronic problems being identified, eating disorders, substance use problems, the, the kind of creation of post-traumatic stress disorder, post-Vietnam in the 1970s, and some of those folks returning to college campuses and, and with returning with some of those severe and chronic problems. Anything you want to add, Sharon or Mary, around yeah, the, was, the, the brief history? Yes, so our history goes up through 1980, but there another very significant um, social and cultural and political um, event was the passage of the American with Disabilities Act in 1990. Yes which also meant that we now see more students coming to our campuses who had services in the past that have helped them be academic, academically successful. And there's an expectation that colleges will prov provide those services as well. Um, well, and, and I would say a legal requirement, not even an expectation. Yes. I mean, ADA yes. really led that, meant that our institutes for education had to provide these services. Right. Um, and then the other thing that I was just gonna add is while some mental health clinics started off with a more medical model and counseling centers started off with a more vocational and developmental model, um, both models actually have the same goal in mind at this time, which is mm -hmm. to um, you know, help students be successful academically and to also um, promote their emotional well-being. So methods may be different, and we're going to talk about, Greg's going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but the general mission of whether you're calling yourself a mental health clinic or a counseling center is the same. Yep. And this is Mary. I think the other thing that I would add is that um, certainly coming forward from that 1980 marker on the on the slide is that we see more and more students arriving at college who are 
certainly intellectually um, and otherwise able to be here and have had previous psychotherapy, perhaps been on meds and arrive at college with that in part of their life history and the expectation of continuing to receive those services. And I think that's been part of the larger picture for a lot of colleges and universities in terms of how much of that service that the um, institution of higher ed would actually provide to that student who arrives perhaps with some, some treatment history and how that interplays again with their academic, social, um, other other successes in the college um, age. Yeah, and I mean, for all of us, I think on this this uh, webinar, you get into the 1990s, and that's when it's lived it's it's a lived memory for all of us. And that's when I first started working in a counseling center was in the early early 1990s, and all the things that, that everyone's already said. I think we're seeing more people coming to us with some more severe and chronic problems. Uh, that, that the work has shifted away from what was the stereotype of, oh, people are just homesick or they're dealing with anxiety and relationship issues. I mean, those things are still part of what we deal with. But as Mary said, we're also dealing with people who've had longstanding treatment histories, you know, over a third of them on medic medication, more than half of them do already per had some outpatient care or in inpatient or partial hospitalization care. Uh, so the, the breadth of what we are expected to do is expanded. All the while, I think there is this cultural shift of, of kind of individualizing and, and decontextualizing mental health. I mean, the DSM-5 can be almost summarized by a, an attempt to categorize every aspect of human suffering and give it a diagnosis and a potential medication treatment. And, and I think we're at a place of kind of questioning that in our work. So some data, um, AEC the service data around mission. You know, as counseling centers, all of us are doing direct service, and that's that's probably been the case most of the time. Uh, but also this idea of, of outreach. I mean, as counseling centers, I think all of us realize that that the individual students coming to us are our clients, but the university campus more broadly is our client, and that's why you see. Uh, classroom campus outreach, uh, meeting with other offices and departments where we're consulting around the difficult cases. That, that's become bread and butter of what we do. And then training, you know, that most of our counseling centers are doing supervision and training. So you see the mission of 100% counseling, outreach, consultation, and, and, and supervision and training graduate students. And then some staff, staff and faculty training, which um, also I think comes with some of the, it overlaps some of that cl classroom and campus outreach. So some modern day uh, service delivery models and organizational structures. Uh, one that has gotten a lot more of attention, but but I think also describes what counseling centers have been doing for a long time, going back to the, the CUBE model, which we'll talk about, is the, the comprehensive counseling center model, which really states real, very clearly what most counseling centers are doing. What that last slide just showed, this is the bread and butter mission of college counseling centers. Another model that's been getting a lot of attention is an integrated care model, which raises questions about, you know, where are the overlaps between a traditional comprehensive college counseling center and student health and, and people doing student health work? Because students come to the health service with mental health concerns, and, and oftentimes they are being seen both places. And is there a way to, to cooperate, communicate, uh, and work together around that? But the tension is how do you not lose, what is your mission? which is what we just outlined around the College Counseling Center model, and we'll talk more about that. And then emerging models really focus on some of the public health wellness, the faculty staff training, some of the outreach and consultation that most counseling centers describe as part of what they do. Sharon and Mary, do you want to add to that? No, I'll just let you get into more detail about each of the models. All right, so a little more about the Comprehensive Counseling Center model. There's a, an article by Bernard All from 2014 this idea that the college student mental health is a specialty field and it requires an understanding of, of student development, identity development, and the impact of oppression on the development of psychological distress. So, you know, in many ways, this article outlines what has been the bread and butter of counseling center work for a long time, understanding this broad developmental perspective, pushing back against this idea that, that every kind of difficult reaction is somehow rooted in the individual, that that's a diagnosis that can be easily treated, and taking this broader development, identity development, as well as kind of social justice framework and, and realizing that the, the work we do in, in classrooms, the work we do around consultations, the work we do around hopefully shifting the culture in a, from a more sh to, to a more social justice framework is going to have a huge impact on campus and that those services are as value, if not as valuable, if not more valuable than the clinical services. Because as all of us know, I mean, one of the main things we hear when we, we present at, at different conferences is more people coming in, 
more serious concerns and funding is flat or decreasing. Uh, so how do we get ahead of that curve? And that's where these non-clinical services, I think, are really important. And that the mental health professionals, the psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, the people in the counseling centers are the people who are the content and context experts and really should be leading voices around campus mental health services. That's definitely something that's part of our mission as AUCCD, and I think something that we all feel pretty strongly about. Mary do, and Sharon, do you have any thoughts about that? Or? Um, I'll jump in with one quick thing, which is I think that if we look at the traditional age college student, the 18 to 25 year old, one of their primary jobs, if you will, has to do with identity development yeah. and maintenance. And I think one of the, the high levels of distress that we see in many students today is that they have an identity that they bring to college, which might be, I'm really smart and they come to college and all of a sudden they're not the smartest student in the class. And, <laughs> and the really deep sense of distress that comes out around that yeah. because it challenges their identity. And so I think that we see that across lots of different kinds of um, identities that students bring. But I, I wanna mention that because I think that feels pretty different um, over time perhaps than it did um, a generation ago. And that I think that comes very much into play in terms of that developmental model and the expertise of, of counseling center um, staff and clinicians to be able to address those concerns that are very much central to the, the sense of self. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I would say is that a lot of students come with that very external locus of control, right? Their sense of identity and self-worth is about how do I compare to other people? Absolutely. When you go to college in a competitive field or competitive um, department, that's pretty hard. And it also, as psychologists, we know that an internal locus control is where we feel more grounding and where we feel like we have some agency. And, and students oftentimes need counseling or need some interventions to help them shift back to, hey, my sense of worth is about my journey and my journey in a context with other people on that social relationships versus these are people I'm competing against. So, next slide, Sharon, if you want to. So here's a Wes Morrill's article with Wedding from 1974, which the Comprehensive Counseling Center model is, is kind of rooted in, looking at the purposes of interventions, the method of interventions, the targets of interventions across individuals, primary groups, association groups, looking at remediation, prevention, development, direct service, consultation training. And this, this really outlines from 1974 what so many of us have been doing, the focus on clinical services, consultation and collaborative work, outreach and prevention programming, and training and education. Again, the bread and butter of what we do, I, I think every counseling center is trying to do these things as best they can in relationship to where they fit within their university structure. So integrated care is something that, that gets a lot of attention. And here's a quote from the National Institute of Mental Health. Integrated care is a team-based approach where mental and physical health services are provided concurrently, oftentimes in the same setting. Go to the next slide. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the challenges with integrated care is so often integrated care conflates the fact of that, that in many integrated physical health care settings, they're bringing a behavioral health consultant into a primary care team. Uh, I think in higher education, where it sometimes gets problematic is trying to bring a whole primary mental health care system, which is a comprehensive counseling center, in relationship to primary care. Uh, I think one of the tensions is, is, should primary care be the gateway to mental health care? Uh, are psychological symptoms seen as a medical problem? Or are they more contextualized? I think the, the tension that often happens in our field is, is around these issues, where college counseling centers see themselves as a, a gateway, and that medicalizing the problem actually tends to make things worse, and not seeing some of the broader cultural and contextual systems can cause a challenge. Uh, this idea that mental health care is a type of medical care, so should be a part of the campus health system center. You know, I've seen this talked about, and, and sometimes I think this gets imposed because people want to save money. Uh, and I've never seen this actually save money. Uh, and then there's also tension about who are the content experts and context experts and who should kind of lead these services. And there are a lot of different structures around this. So, I mean, it's not that there are always tensions. Sometimes these things work out well. Sometimes they're a challenge, but we'll talk about some of that challenge when, when things are moved in a direction and not everybody's in agreement. Uh, but, but clearly having some behavioral health and psychological care within a primary care setting and community and veteran settings have been shown to be very effective. ACA data has shown um, cost reductions and increased life saving when behavioral health is integrated into primary care settings. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate into how 
a student health service will, will look in relationship to a traditional and a comprehensive college counseling service. Thoughts about that, Sharon and Mary? No, nope, I'm good. Okay. So some emerging models around public health and, and wellness. Uh, the Jed Foundation has a comprehensive approach. Uh, you can see the eight dimensions of wellness from, from SAMHSA. Many of them focus on emotional, spiritual, intellectual, physical, uh, financial, occupational. Uh, the Okanagan Charter from 2015 is called an action of embedding health into all aspects of campus culture, uh, health and well-being and wellness across the administration, operations, academic mandates. Uh, the the Okanagan Charter comes out of, of Canada, I think, uh, British Columbia, uh, and leading health promotion action, collaborating locally, globally. And, and you can see some of the, the organizations that have supported that, NASPA, NURSA, ACCCD, we've kind of all talked about some of these things. And you can see the statement on health and well-being and higher education there. Some other emerging models around this, I think some, some similarities. Obviously, when you've, there's a focus on wellness, there's a focus on prevention, there's a focus on health promotion. Uh, the Comprehensive College Counseling Center model has this focus on the upstream approaches as well and has for, for quite a long time. But it is important for all of us to see that all campus stakeholders are responsible for mental health. It's not just the counseling center, though the counseling center is often central and plays a, a content expert role. Uh, there's a lot of mental health work that can be done that doesn't have to be done by the counseling center, but some of it really needs the expertise of mental health professionals doing the work day in and day out. It's not the primary responsibility of the counseling health service, but oftentimes the focus is there. Uh, but many colleges, including Penn's, established a, a new uh, wellness uh, associate kind of vice provost, and a lot of counselor or a lot of colleges are looking at kind of wellness centers. It often includes recreation, health promotion, health counseling, other student support services. You know, I think the, the issue is how do you provide kind of leadership, philosophy, how do these things overlap? Uh, I think wellness and well-being can be so large, they're just comprehensive, and then it's hard to define, well, what are you really doing? How, what, how are you trying to make a change and shift the needle around some of these wellness initiatives? How do you share leadership? How do you, to get, how do you put together effective teams that are kind of all on the same page and know each other's responsibility and, and work well together. In some ways, it's like, how do you put together a good basketball team where you got people who rebound and shoot and play defense or, or any kind of sport uh, where, where people are kind of figuring out and know their roles in relationship to each other. Sharon, Mary, anything on, on this one? Yeah, I was just going to echo that there certainly is a trend right now towards comprehensive wellness centers that also include recreation. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, including recreation definitely taps into that upstream approach of how do we promote health on our campuses and also i think um provide some fertile ground having all of these services in the same place does provide some fertile ground for ease of referral continuity of care um you know just making um showing a value around wellness and um not focusing exclusively on the clinical aspect of maybe mm -hmm. what the health center does or what the counseling center does, but how do we um, merge all of these things? So I would definitely say that's something that's uh, getting a lot more attention. Yeah, and I think that's where the, the added benefit of counseling services and health services is, where we can really look at the whole population. We can develop a web of relationships that support students, that if these services are outsourced or, or you're relying only on some technology vendors to do this, the institution is not going to have uh, the same influence in the broader public health perspective. And I think that's where, like you said, these emerging models that focus on prevention and health promotion are really important. And that's what I would add in terms of whether, whether we're looking at the JED model or the SAMHSA eight dimensions, and there's some other models that have even nine dimensions of, of wellness. The idea that there is expertise, content and context expertise around each of those kinds of areas of wellness on most campuses. And I think the really strong um, opportunity to collaborate more closely in the way we provide services to students so that it, it does continue or perhaps becomes a shared responsibility rather than people being in silos to provide um, bits of, of programming or bits of service. The idea of looking at this in a much more integrated, um, mm -hmm. holistic way, I think really is a, is a strength. Yeah. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of the research on um, 
various counseling center models. And I'll start off just by saying that most of the research that's been done has been around um, integrated care in college settings. And so there are a couple of specific studies that I'm gonna talk about one that was conducted by the American College Health Association in 2010, and a more recent study by um, Redeem that was done in 2018. And then also um, we'll talk some about um, some of the data from our own survey at AUCCD and some recent surveys uh, that look at student data in particular using um, the Center for Collegiate Mental Health um, Research. So um, one of the things that um, people have tried to sort of capture is how to, how to define or operationalize what an integrated center would look like. And the model used by um, the American College Health Association, also by Redeem in his study, look at the actual reporting structure of the counseling center and the health center. Um, and in Redeem's study, um, he came up with five different types of, of organizational structures, um, which I'm not gonna go through all of them, but one example would be where you have um, a counseling center director and a health center director who all report to the same senior director. Um, another model might be where you have a health center director who reports to the counseling center director who reports to another senior administrator at the university. So there are lots of different ways of kind of configuring what does it mean to be integrated. And this, again, is focusing less on service delivery and what people are doing and more on who they're reporting to. So, he also identified three non-integrated models. And um, in the non-integrated models, this is where there's much more independence um, between um, the director of the health center and the director of the counseling center. So the three models that he has are where both the health director, center director and the counseling center director report to the same person, or where both of them report to a different person, um, or where um, health services in some cases um, actually are contracted out or outsourced. So aren't technically the staff that uh, provide these services might not be employees of the university, but there may be a senior administrator that they sort of have to report to where the contract goes through that particular office. So, and looking at the white paper, the central question in the paper for ACHA what, was, what are the benefits of integrated care? And they actually had um, over, I believe, 369 um, centers participate. And of those 300 and, excuse me, 359 centers, 92 were determined to be integrated. And they recruited from ACHA, they recruited from AUCCD, and then there's a health center list server that they also recruited from. And some of the findings of their study um, were that um, there were several service-related improvements, um, including better meeting the needs of students, having more comprehensive services, um, you know, greater utilization of services, the quality of the clinical services were better, client satisfaction, and you know, um, I mentioned comprehensive. Well, there's comprehensive services, there's also comprehensive programs. So that would speak to maybe some of the outreach efforts. Um, sure, can, can I add something there? I mean, I was one of the authors on this this white paper, and I think one of the challenges with this is is many times people misinterpreted this as being prescriptive. Uh, the goal of this white paper was really to find out about people who described themselves as integrated and, and see what they saw as the benefits were. Uh, it wasn't ever meant to say at a place where people maybe didn't want to be more integrated, this is what you should do for these reasons. So, I mean, I think it's one of, one of the challenges of interpret, interpreting this white paper and, and how people think about it. Right. And I think something to keep in mind is even though they had 359 respondents, the data, they, there wasn't a comparison group. So they didn't do anything right. they further question the people who weren't integrated. 
to get an understanding of what they thought might be effective about what they were doing. So you, we're just hearing from the 92 centers that were deemed integrated. Um, in a more recent study, um, Kevin Redeen expanded and replicated um, the ACHA study. He had a larger sample. He um, actually gave, um, used a measure of integration. So he looked at certain variables to see um, to what extent did having an integrated center help with practice workflow, um, to you know, coordination of care, things like that. Um, to what extent, extent did um, it help with collaboration on treatment plans or identification like screening students who might be at risk for some behavioral health issues. So um, in his study, he found that with the integrated centers, more collaboration occurred between physical health providers and behavioral health providers. Um, and I put the term behavioral health in quotes because in medical set settings, mental health providers are often called behavioral health providers. Um, he also found that counseling and physical health, um, were, when the centers were integrated, they were more likely to be located in the same place. They were more likely to share records and they were more likely to communicate with each other on a more regular basis. One thing that I wanna say about the participants in the study were um, directors of college health centers. So um, they did not, once again, have a comparison group looking from the perspective of freestanding, um, more traditional college counseling centers. Um, so, and also that also means that the number of people whose professional who would identify their professional discipline as being from a mental health background was very, very low in this particular study. Um, but some other findings were there were no differences in how integrated and non-integrated centers identified you know, which students might need some assistance um, or in referring people to, um, to care and coordinating that care. And then finally, and, and this, this last finding is something that we've seen in other studies is that regardless of integration status, if there were behavioral health providers in the health centers, there was more integration with um, mental health providers. So um, that, actually replicate some findings that we have found in, in college counseling centers elsewhere and health centers. Um, some of the limitations as I've sort of mentioned is that they tend to refer, rely on staff perception rather than specific clinical data from students. Um, and that mental health professionals are underrepresented. Um, there are no comparison groups with college counseling centers. So how do we know if an integrated center is more effective or equally effective if we're not, we don't have anything to compare it to. And um, there's no data on how integration impacted service demands or resource scarcity, which frankly in college mental health are probably our top priorities right now, which is how do we provide timely services to all of the students who are seeking it. And then I, uh, a very interesting finding that was conducted by David Reitz in 2016, he matched um, the counseling center director and the health center director from the same institution and asked them, is your counseling and health center integrated? And 68% of the time, they gave a different answer. So we clearly are having issues even in defining what integration is. Um, so is integration necessary in order to provide quality services to, to students? I think it depends on who you ask, because based on the AUCCD survey, the overwhelming majority of counseling center directors feel, uh, report that they collaborate with their health centers, um, some or most of the time. Um, a similar overwhelming majority report these interactions to be effective or very effective. Um, and then not surprisingly, we saw that schools that had a smaller enrollment were more likely to share resources such as check-in process, front desk, waiting room, and joint staff meetings. So I'm just going to pause and see if Greg or Mary have something that they would like to add around just what the research is saying. Yeah, I mean, my experience from consulting and talking with folks is, is basically what's confirmed by the slide, which is it makes more sense at a smaller center. And, and I think you see some of these more integrated systems where you have 
maybe one physician and a couple of nurses who might report to a psychologist who oversees health and account health and counseling and they're using a similar you know waiting room or front desk staff because of cost it's much more complicated when you're talking about you know 100 medical staff and 70 counseling or 60 counseling center staff to make these things uh, work together in a way because they are different systems and, and I think it's there's a, a, a lot of different perceptions about what this means and how collaboration and integration work between these two systems that are there to meet very different needs. And I would add that um, across a fair number of consulting or accreditation field visits at different universities, I, I think the first two points on this slide um, seem really consistent to me that regardless of what the actual structure is, that the nature of the working relationship, that a positive collaborative working relationship between the counseling center and the health service um, certainly happens a lot, maybe a lot more than we might expect, um, even if they are housed separately or have different reporting structures administratively. Um, and, you know, so one of the things, obviously, just as, as the studies conducted with the health center directors, um, many of the respondents had a medical background um, in within the AUCCD membership, um, the overwhelming majority of folks are not medical providers. Only 2% of the directors in our organization have a medical background, either in psychiatry, general medicine, or nursing, or something along those lines. So, um, one of the questions that we regularly ask um, of the members of AUCCD is whether or not they share records with the health services without a for informed consent. And 74% of directors say no. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about sort of some cultural differences between um, counselors and other mental health professionals versus people who have more of a medical background and why that answer may be what it is. So, and, and I guess I want to, I also want to stress that that is a major sticking point with regard to integration as far as people who have a more traditional approach to um, college mental health are concerned. Um, and so, but the proponents of integrated care often claim that allowing health providers to have access to clinical records will improve student care. However, the Center for Collegiate Mental Health um, did a study last year with a sample of almost 200 um, institutions representing over 90,000 unique students who sought services that year. And they found that actually treatment outcomes were not significantly different regardless of the level of access the health center staff had to counseling records. So whether it was none, partial, or full, it really did not have an impact. And not only does this study, but the other studies that I've talked about um, really point to the need to have actual more, to have more data from students. Um, previous studies have focused a lot on what the professionals think about how things are going, but they aren't really using the hard data based on their client utilization, client satisfaction data. It's more the perception of things are going better or they're the same or whatever. And we really do need to use the data that the students are providing us because we're there to serve their needs. Whoops. So um, some promising practices, and I mentioned this before, is that actually having um, either health, the medical providers do brief mental health assessments is a good thing within um, a student health center. So because students are more likely to share, if you ask them about their behavioral health problems or um, things they're struggling with, they're more likely to tell you that. And so, and obviously if the medical professors are more aware that a student has depression or anxiety, they're more likely to prescribe um, for that. So um, having the, the medical professionals engage in a little bit of screening is a helpful thing. And then also having behavioral health providers in the health center working alongside the primary care um, providers has been shown to be effective in terms of uh, 
you know, the medical providers can, can provide a warm handoff. They literally can walk the student over to the behavioral health specialist or ask the behavioral specialist to come into the room. Um, more consultation can go on. Um, if there's a behavioral health provider who can spend a little bit more time assessing what the student needs, then they can make a more appropriate referral for longer term care, either to a counseling center that's on campus or to providers in the community. Um, people were more likely um, to follow through um, if there was a behavioral, with a referral, if a behavioral health person was involved. Um, and just there was an overall perception of better patient care. Yeah, Sharon, one thing I would say about because there are models at, at Syracuse, I know UT Austin, Cornell, I think Penn, we're, we're working on uh, developing a behavioral health consulting, embedded someone, embedding someone in student health services who, who does this work. And it can have huge benefits for care. And I think also it can allay some of the concerns that might lead to health services wanting access to mental health care records. I think some of that's driven because people are afraid some of these things aren't going to happen. So I think if you do some of these things well, you can maintain some of the, the barriers because, you know, they're just different ways of seeing information. And in medicine, more information is always better. More lab tests gives you better ideas of diagnoses and treatment. In, in me mental health care, more information may actually bias you in ways that are problematic. So, you know, therapy notes are not like lab results. And having those kind of conversations of why they need to be different, I think, are really important. Um, so sort of the last thing I wanted to say about research is that clearly there really hasn't been a lot of research done, which means that we need to proceed with caution when we talk about uh, best practices or uh, superior uh, models of organizational structures, because we don't have a lot of data on the subject. Um, so as I mentioned before, we need to get more student data. We also um, we haven't talked a lot today about the fact there's a lot of diversity on our campuses and that influences where students seek help, when they seek help, for what types of concerns. And so we need to be looking at that because there may be students who actually feel much more comfortable viewing their um, mental health issues as a medical issue. And so they're more likely to walk through the health services door. And so having a philosophy and working together where it doesn't really matter what door the student walks through, eventually they get the help that they need is really what we should be striving for. Um, and then we also need to look at what predicts true collaboration across professional dis disciplines um, and cultures because um, who you report to or being in the same building may or may not predict anything about collaboration. There, there are centers where the health center and the counseling center are in the same building and they don't collaborate that much. And so just putting somebody in the same location could help or it may be like not a factor at all. Any other comments on the research? No, okay, Mary. No. Were you gonna say something? No, I think we're ready to move forward. Okay. So in terms of the this next section, I'm going to move pretty quickly because I do want to allow us to have some time for Q&A. And when we look at these challenges of discipline, cultural differences, we're really looking at some historical patterns that are the, and some broad characterizations. And so the concept with mental health services or counseling center services, more often collaborative relationships and, and power structures tend to be more equalized. And in a medical model, as you might guess, that particularly in hospital settings or medical clinic settings, um, the, that there is an order in terms of who tends to um, direct the program, direct the um, next steps, that sort of thing, which certainly in um, a, a surgery or other medical situation, I want my doctor to be, um, you know, leading that. When we look at the nature of healing, again, broadly, mutual relationships being um, foundational to a lot of mental health work, particularly because um, thinking about counseling center work and colleges in specific, students are generally gonna seem the same provider, the same uh, behavioral or mental health provider clinician for ongoing treatment versus in a medical setting where a student might see the same person several times ongoing, but also might see whoever is available to, to see them at that time, particularly when it's a, a, larger, a larger clinic. 
when we think about the language that's used, tip, and again, these are these are broad patterns and historical patterns that, that might be shifting some, but within counseling center settings, we often talk about clients and we talk about clients, student clients and bringing issues of concerns versus a medical model discussing disease or illness and referring to the consumer as a patient. And in terms of training, I think the mental health models, especially with counseling centers, more developmental mod model where you've got mastery of skills for providing counseling or psychotherapy, and particularly with, when we're working with traditional college age, 18 to 25 year olds. When we look at a medical model, an apprenticeship model, traditional teaching model that was more developed for invasive bedside procedures or surgical residency, different focus, different kind of training. And there's some shift even now to more simulation based and some standardized curriculum, even around sort of medical training. Confidentiality, as Sharon mentioned earlier, this very often is, is a sticking point. And I think it has to do with the view of how much information is needed and the concept of information being shared on a need to know basis within counseling centers, within mental health more broadly. Many of us certainly that were trained some time ago had very strong training around not sharing information unless there was a release of information and ROI from the client and that before sharing information in advance with the client, a discussion around what would be shared in what circumstances, um, clear conversation around the limits of confidentiality in terms of legal abuse reporting, that sort of thing where I think medical culture has had a broader look at having all information accessible in one place to a larger number of professionals, which I think, again, in a hospital or outpatient health clinic setting would be really, really important. But I think how this issue of confidentiality is defined and negotiated really is a, is a key pivotal piece around how different units may work together. So in adopting a counseling center structure, we really, I think, have to be deliberate to look at these various points in terms of the mission. And I referenced this in an earlier con comment that I made. Some campuses are going to be very full range of services and provide everything a student might need. Um, those are fewer and further apart in today's economic structure, I think. There are some centers that are high quality that do brief initial assessments, brief therapy, and perhaps refer on depending on the acuity or chronicity of the, the student symptoms. But the mission, I think, has to be really clearly defined, and that's going to come from the institutional level in terms of what is the philosophy of care, what is the scope of practice that the institution um, is able and willing to support for the counseling center. And then the next, looking at uh, what we call a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to the current counseling center model. And depending on what that reveals, then if changes are to be made, really being deliberate to utilize that assessment um, as, as any changes might be implemented or discussed. Thinking about the drivers of proposed changes, certainly in the last 10 years or so, fundings have often been tight for higher institutions, either whether that's state funded or other sources. And counseling centers have faced an increased demand at a time of sometimes reduced or level flat structures for funding. So if potential changes are happening, is it around finances, physical location, a reorganization, new leadership, but really looking specifically at those. And then last, thinking about change management strategy, and we'll talk about that a bit more in, in a couple of slides. So mission and philosophy. Very briefly, at the, at the beginning of this program, you saw on an early slide, we talked about the vision and the mission. We don't mention it on this slide, but also the values that are, in, that are of importance to the institution and to the counseling center. And then as you look further, really examining who, who do you serve? What is your campus culture, the institutional history? What is the makeup of your student enrollment? Also, what are the resources available um, in the community and are those resources both available, accessible, acceptable in the way that they're structured? Would students take a referral to some of these other resources? And if a college or university is located in an area where they're 
are fewer community resources that students will actually be able to utilize, then I think that gives a different focus on what the counseling center and the institution might be providing. So again, just briefly, um, outside consultants, national benchmarking data, we've uh, referenced several of those um, previously in this, in this discussion, but I think the, the state of California in looking at their counseling center structures I did a SWOT analysis. So I would really recommend that to you as um, one possible framework or structure to be able to uh, assess what a current situation is, look at what potential future arrangements might look like, and, and really build in some data to support whatever that decision-making process might be. So I mentioned some of these earlier when we talk about change drivers, available resources, both on campus and also off of campus. What, what can students access? And are there unique campus factors? Because campus traditions around who gets admitted to the institution, whether that's gender or race or other demographics that come into play that affect who is at the university and who's being served, I think we really have to be deliberate to look at, at those factors as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the philosophy of care, the scope of practice, what is the institution able and willing to provide to the students? And quite frankly, there are some universities that are in locations with quite good local resources available to students at um, a, a fairly reasonable cost, and students might be more likely to utilize those resources and not be as reliant on, on campus resources. And I'll briefly take a breath there. Sharon and, and Greg, do you have anything to add? No, I think we probably need to wrap up here. Just with the, Okay. Right. So just quickly looking at the change management strategy, um, this speaks, I think, largely for itself, but I would say the third point to me is highly um, significant in terms of seeking input from every perspective, because sometimes the 30,000 foot view is very different than the 10,000 foot than the, the experience on the ground of the direct providers. So I think, look at these pieces, they're pretty direct. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time going over those. Yeah, one thing I would just say about change management, I mean, my experience is if you can get people who do the work on the front line excited about a change, and get it grassroots, it's going to go way better than if this is someone at a vice president level saying, I'm going to save money and it's my idea and, and people aren't on board with it. The making a real rational and emotional case where you're really weaving together what people feel strongly about, which is caring for students in the best way they can, it's going to be much more likely to be successful. Agreed. So if we move forward, there are some good, um, there's some really solid information about this next slide in the white paper. So I would encourage those on our webinar to, to get a copy of the white paper, take a closer look at that, because mm -hmm. really these three different um, types of organizational structure, parallel collaboration or integration are very, very well spelled out. And um, if that comes up as a question, I'm happy to address that when we get to the Q&A. The last slide before we do Q&A, the thing I would emphasize is there is not one best model for counseling center or mental health, um, student health kinds of services. I think it really has to be tailored to the student population, to the location of the institution, to the resources that are available. And looking at those counseling center functions for the campus, there are bulleted points there on the slide that really are the points that I think have to be considered in, in determining whether the current um, available resources are, are adequate or if something's gonna change, what direction that might go in. So I'll stop there. Great, uh, thank you all for uh, your, your comments and presentation uh, on this really important topic uh, when we're thinking about uh, organizing our, our counseling centers so that they can be in, in fact uh, most helpful in supporting our students, and, and that's what, what it comes down to at the end of the day. Uh, we do have a ton of questions, uh, but for the sake of time, I am going to try to put a couple of the uh, thematic uh, ideas together. And one thing that is coming up a lot is the future of this research. Uh, and so for the three of you and for, for your colleagues and networks, what do you uh, think is the, the future of uh, you know, you alluded to uh, a lot of the the research needed, but where can we where can we go from here? 
I actually think the Center for Collegiate Mental Health will be a great resource, like the study that they just did on changes in student symptoms based on whether or not health services professionals had access to um, the counseling center records showed that it really didn't. And so I really think the future needs to focus on places like that and places like um, the um, healthy, healthy Mind study that comes out of the University of Michigan that uses actual student information, I think will really help us start to look at what's working and what's not working. Um, and moving away from, at least to some extent, so much focus on the perceptions of the people who are delivering the work, because I think not intentionally, but it can be sort of self-serving to say what I'm doing is great, but it may not necessarily reflect uh, the impact that it's having on students. And so I definitely think we need to be collecting more student data. Yeah, and I would second that. I mean, the Center for Collegiate Mental Health has been something that ACCD has supported since its inception. And because we realized we needed good data, and it's a very large practice network that shows that counseling centers do work. I mean, Ben's published some great, great articles that show symptom amelioration across a lot of different dimensions as counseling centers as its own treatment intervention. And we need to continue. We, we know what we're doing is working. But we need to get more granular data about some of these structures and how changes and, and tweaks might benefit the people we're providing care to. Agreed. And then the other thing I would say, and I think people don't use this nearly enough, is your own local data about what's happening on your yeah. campus and looking at trends and looking at who's using services and who's not using services and trying to um, talk to your students about why that's the case um, and looking at um, the value in um, reaching out to the campus in ways that are non-clinical and um, seeing, you know, because different campuses have different expectations about that. Um, I, I know most places I've ever worked had a clear expectation that they wanted the counseling center to be involved in the entire campus and not just doing clinical work. So finding out, you know, what it is your campus needs from you and also then advocating for resources. So if they're wanting you to be all over the place, then they're going to have to invest more resources to make that possible. So using your own local data, I think, is really important. And I would add to that in terms of really the piece about not only who is using the service, but who on campus may not be using the service for, for whatever reason, stigma, demographics, and, and be able to identify on campus who the partners are, who the collaborators are to reach out to those students to find ways to make the counseling center and other resources more acceptable and then accessed by students. Great, thank you. Um, and with that, uh, we are basically out of time for today's presentation. And I wanna thank Greg, Sharon, and Mary uh, for, for sharing uh, with us today. And for uh, all the rest of you, I do want to mention one more time that this uh, webinar has been recorded and it will be available tomorrow along with a copy of a slide. Uh, so you can feel free to share it along with your networks uh, and to, to pass it forward to others. And for those of you who we were not able to uh, answer your questions, uh, we will we'll do our best to go through and, and answer those individually and share those out with the community. Uh, so yeah, thank you for, for joining us today and we hope that you have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.